Parenteral access for fluid administration in patients with Ebola virus disease. This short film summarizes the results of a Cochrane systematic review comparing the reliability, ease of use, and speed of insertion of different ways of achieving parenteral access with a focus on the clinical management of patients with Ebola virus disease. Imagine this scenario. You're a clinician working in an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone. You've just put on your personal protective equipment and you're about to enter the red zone. It's hot, almost 30 degrees. You're already sweating and your glasses are steaming up. There are lots of sick patients to attend to. Some of them are too drowsy to drink and will die from dehydration unless you can secure parenteral access for fluid administration. You could put up a regular drip, but getting intravenous access can be hard wearing three pairs of gloves and foggy goggles, especially in dehydrated patients with collapsed veins. And in any case, many patients will yank them out. If this happens at night when there are too few nurses around, patients might get only a fraction of their daily fluid requirement. This could mean renal failure and death from dehydration. In response to this, some doctors treating Ebola patients recommend the use of intraosseous lines because it might be harder for agitated patients to pull the needles out. But will this take more time? And what if you can't get the bone needle inserted properly? Then again, perhaps we should consider using subcutaneous lines. But would patients get enough fluid? The results of this Cochrane review cannot provide definitive answers to these important clinical questions, but it does provide information that can inform these decisions. The review was initiated by staff at the Clinical Trials Unit of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in response to the current Ebola crisis in West Africa and was conducted with funding support from the Cochrane Editorial Unit. We searched for all randomized control trials comparing the reliability ease of use and speed of insertion of different ways of securing parenteral access. We found 17 randomized control trials involving 885 participants. Four trials compared intravenous and intraosseous access, 11 compared intravenous and subcutaneous access, one compared saphenous vein cut down and intraosseous access, and one compared intraperitoneal access with intravenous and subcutaneous. There were important methodological weaknesses in many of the included trials, and so we need to be very careful when interpreting the results. But as of November 2014, when we conducted our searches, this is the best information available. All doctors are familiar with setting up intravenous infusions, but experience with intraosseous lines is much less common. However, in the trials comparing intravenous and intraosseous access, there were actually more insertion failures with intravenous access, and intravenous lines took longer to set up. 45% of patients in the IV group experienced an insertion failure, compared to 12% in the intraosseous group. It took about one minute longer to insert an intravenous line than to insert an intraosseous line into the tibia. For example, in one trial, it took on average almost six minutes to insert an IV line compared to an average of just over four and a half minutes to insert a tibial intraosseous line. Now, these modest differences probably wouldn't matter in most clinical situations, but they could be important when time is limited by heat stress and overwhelming patient numbers. In some Ebola treatment centers, each doctor is responsible for up to 50 patients. Perhaps not surprisingly, achieving intravenous access using a saphenous vein cut down also took longer than intraosseous access and was more likely to fail. However, intravenous access has an important advantage when compared to intraosseous access. A much larger volume of fluid can be infused via the intravenous route. In one of the included trials, twice as much fluid 800 mils versus 400 mils was infused through an IV line compared to an intraosseous line. Intraosseous flow rates can be improved using a pressure bag, but if infusing large volumes of fluid is essential, IV lines may be preferable. On the other hand, some patients might not be severely dehydrated, but are at risk of dehydration because they're not drinking enough to keep up with their fluid losses. In these patients, the subcutaneous route is a quick and easy way to provide maintenance fluids.
Subcutaneous infusions are often used to keep patients hydrated in community settings. However, they might also have a role in the management of patients with Ebola virus disease. It should be possible to give around a litre of fluid per 12 hours via the subcutaneous route. In trials comparing intravenous and subcutaneous access, there were more insertion failures and dislodgements with intravenous access. This is no surprise. As the video shows, putting a line into the subcutaneous fat is quick and easy. Indeed, in the included trials, there were no insertion failures in the subcutaneous group, whereas 18% of patients in the IV group experienced an insertion failure. One trial found that inserting an IV line takes about two minutes longer than inserting a subcutaneous line, five minutes versus three minutes. Compared to subcutaneous, clinicians judged the intravenous route as being more difficult to insert, and they noted that patients were more likely to be agitated in the intravenous group. Patients in the intravenous group were more likely to develop phlebitis, but were less likely to develop erythema or swelling than those in the subcutaneous group. Of course, a certain amount of tissue swelling is only to be expected with subcutaneous fluid administration. However, once again, more fluid can be infused via the intravenous route, and so if it's essential to deliver large volumes, a subcutaneous line may be better than no fluid at all, but not as good as an intravenous line. As regards comparisons of the intraperitoneal route with either the intravenous or subcutaneous route, there was no reliable evidence of any difference for any of the outcomes we looked at. In summary, the choice of parenteral access method will depend on site-specific issues such as the availability and expertise of medical and nursing staff, patient numbers and local infrastructure. If intravenous access can be achieved easily, this facilitates the infusion of larger volumes of fluid. However, if this is not possible, intraosseous and subcutaneous routes are alternatives that can be achieved rapidly. The subcutaneous route may be suitable for patients who are not severely dehydrated, but in whom ongoing losses cannot be met by oral intake. Given the ease of insertion of subcutaneous lines, they could be inserted by healthcare workers with minimal medical training. We acknowledge that none of the included trials included patients with Ebola virus disease although we think it's very likely that the advantages and disadvantages of the different methods will be similar in the context of Ebola. However, if after looking at the evidence in this review, clinicians caring for patients with Ebola virus disease are still uncertain about the best strategy for securing parenteral access, then we would recommend that they resolve their uncertainty by conducting further randomized controlled trials of the different approaches. These trials should be prospectively registered, properly randomized with secure allocation concealment and should be reported according to established standards. The Cochrane Review can be read in full on the Cochrane Library which is available on the internet at www.thecochranelibrary.com.